today is really uh, a celebration, celebration of gratitude. We're here to ce celebrate the science and the spirit of gratitude. And that's just perfect, you know, when you think about it, it's really ideal because that's what gratitude is. It's a celebration. Brother David, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for about 15 years, he says that gratitude is basically a celebration. And by celebration, he says that gratitude is a, it's a, a heightened and focused intellectual and emotional appreciation. That's what a celebration is. It's a heightened and focused intellectual and emotional appreciation where our emotions are sharpened. They're intensified in an act of appreciation that we call gratitude. So it's really fitting that we celebrate the concept of gratitude. Gratitude is, in fact, a celebration. We also uh, celebrate the spirit of Sir John Templeton, without whom this entire initiative, including this conference, would not have happened. Uh, his generosity has made the scientific exploration of gratitude possible. Sir John, as you may know, was a global investor, and he understood very well that the best investment we can make is with our minds, which can determine, cultivate thoughts that enable us to grow, to, to prosper, to flourish. Okay? No matter what obstacles and challenges we have that we confront, we can overcome them. The goal is to become emotionally and spiritually prosperous, and Sir John uh, emphasized and pioneered ideas related to the human spirit that withstood the test of time. Not new ideas, not trendy ideas, not the hottest ideas, but ideas that go back into time, the perennial ideas of which gratitude would be one. And I like this quote of Sir John's that I think you can see on the monitors. He says, when we fill our minds with blessings and gratitude, an inner shift in consciousness can occur. As we focus on the abundance in our lives, rather than what we lack, a wonderful blueprint for the future begins to emerge. Okay. Sir John's son, Dr. Jack Templeton, is the president of the Templeton Foundation and, like his dad, lives, practices the virtue of gratitude. Dr. Templeton says that gratitude, especially to God, is the prerequisite to all other spiritual and moral virtues that a spirit of gratitude is the mainspring for love and generosity toward others. Okay. I mentioned that uh, the foundation got the science of gratitude underway some years ago. This is a picture. I'm, I'm sorry, the quality is a little fuzzy. This is in the year 2000. There was a small gathering of scholars in Dallas, Texas, and Brother David was there. You can see him. He's about in the middle with his arms like this. The, con the topic of gratitude became, became, uh, began somewhat modestly with the numbers. Phil Watkins was there, Brother David. Uh, modestly with respect to numbers, but big with respect to ideas. This conference funded by the foundation uh, was entitled Kindling, Kindling the Science of Gratitude. We wanted to kindle it. We wanted to uh, have a spark to get the science going. This was 13 years ago, 14 years ago, October 2000, the Center for World Thanksgiving in Dallas, Texas. And uh, that's where it all uh, started. Since that time, research on gratitude has really taken off, has really accelerated. I think you can see this is a psych info, number of hits in peer-reviewed journals, studies of gratitude in adults. And you see there's virtually nothing until about 2003, 2004, to about a decade ago, and there's been a swift and rapid acceleration of research uh, over the last several years, and we anticipate this number to go even higher as we project this graph forward. Who knows, you know, there's really no limit, particularly with all the projects that are being funded through this initiative. So that's very exciting uh, to see. Just to summarize some of those studies. So this one slide summarizes about 10 years of research showing that gratitude, whether it's a trait, a disposition that people carry around with them in their heads, or as a quality that can be cultivated when people practice gratitude, brings a variety of benefits, emotional, motivational, 
social, it's part of resilience. I won't go through each of these little panels there, but in terms of emotional well-being, in terms of relational well-being, in terms of generosity, in terms of coping with stress, less depression, lower depression levels, more resilience to uh, traumatic-induced stress, we find that gratitude makes a difference. Gratitude is good medicine when it comes to physical health. That gratitude works in a variety of ways. It's associated with better life outcomes. In fact, the, the uh, mantra that I've adopted when I give talks on gratitude, I usually start by saying something like this, that gratitude has the power to heal, to energize, and to change lives. And that's what the research has demonstrated. That's what research continues to demonstrate now. We're moving into the second phase of gratitude research in terms of looking at why. What are some of the mechanisms by which gratitude has the ability to heal, to energize, and change lives? And you'll be hearing about some of that research today by some of the awardees who are working on research projects in the area of physical health and gratitude. So really exciting stuff. Little wonder then. Gratitude has been referred to as the secret to life. Did you know that? That's what uh, Albert Schweitzer, the famed humanitarian, said. Gratitude is the secret to life. Somebody else said that gratitude is the key that opens all doors. Another person said that gratitude is the most passionate, transformative force in the cosmos. So, great announcements and pronouncements about the nature of gratitude. Now we're finding that, in fact, gratitude does deliver what it promises to in the history of ideas and thoughts. There's been a number of uh, books published as well, intended for general audiences, academic books as well as trade books. Here's a, a, a handful of those. Should be one more. Oh, there it is. Uh, Based on that conference in Dallas, uh, the Oxford University Press published The Psychology of Gratitude, an edited collection. That's more of an academic book. Phil Watkins' book came out earlier this uh, year, Gratitude in the Good Life. And then uh, Giacomo Bono and uh, Jeffrey Fro, colleagues, also earlier this year, Making Grateful Kids, all about making grateful kids, right? Uh, ha, ha, the development, gratitude starts early in life. Why wait? till you're old when you can practice gratitude earlier and set the foundation for later positive growth and flourishing throughout the lifespan. So uh, you'll hear from Giacomo a little bit later uh, today. Charles Shelton was a colleague of mine, passed away earlier this year. He was a Jesuit priest and also a psychologist at Regis University. He wrote the book The Gratitude Factor. All of these books include the science. There's been other books also on gratitude for the general audience. But these are ones based on the science of gratitude, taking the research results, putting them in a form which people can actually benefit from and uh, use. So a lot of exciting stuff. You see articles in major media outlets. You saw in the video clip there. You know, one question I get asked from time to time is, what's the state of gratitude right now? You know, like, I guess they mean, you know, broadly, internationally or nationally. Are we becoming more grateful or, or less grateful? And, uh, you know, it's a very difficult question to ask, right? Because how do you really have an answer for that? Uh, it seems to me that though we are in somewhat of a gratitude renaissance, I mean, look, how, look around how many people there are at this meeting. Look at these, you know, these books, these publications, research productivity, conferences, media reports, people keeping gratitude journals, uh, people with starting gratitude websites, entrepreneurs with ideas about gratitude. This stuff is certainly out there, right? And I come across it every day. Just yesterday, uh, uh, right off campus, UC Davis, Car pulls up, somebody yells at me, hey, Dr. Edmonds, right? You study gratitude, right? It's like, yeah, okay, <laughs> I do. And they say, you know, I read your book. And, you know, gratitude, they said, changed my life. And we hear that all the time from people, that gratitude changes their lives. One lady is 93 years old. She lives in New Jersey. And she started practicing gratitude four years ago. Clara Morabito is her name. She says, gratitude has changed my life. She has transformed her life. She plans to live to be 100 years old, and she says gratitude is going to get her there. So we're going to keep track. And actually, she, she, she emails me all the time, and she's very active. She's on, she's on Facebook, you know. She just wrote a letter 
and it was published by the New York Times, a letter to the editor, because it was about doing medical studies, drug studies on the elderly and how you have to be very careful in terms of drug interactions and side effects. And she's saying that older individuals are not often included in drug trials and medical research. So she says, you gotta do that, you know? And so uh, she's very active. She gives talks in her community about the power of gratitude. So we find inspiration from all walks of life, from kids around eight years old to people well into their 80s and 90s. Okay, we've already seen, I'll just skip over these two because they're about all the uh, RFP winners. Actually, uh, if you are one of the researchers in this uh, initiative, uh, in terms of one of the grants or one of the graduate student dissertation researchers, could you just stand up for just a minute so people can see who you are and we can uh, congratulate them and applaud their research? Great. Well done. Well done, you know, we, we put into practice these ideas, but they're only as good as the research that they're based on. So uh, without their work, you know, we really don't have a practice of gratitude. The initiative is about science, and it is about practice, to promote evidence-based practices of gratitude in medical, educational, organizational settings in schools, workplaces, homes and communities, and we're making inroads in all those domains and all those venues, trying to understand ways in which gratitude can be incorporated to make life better for self and for others. As Sir John stated back in this conference in October of 2000, I still remember very vividly him standing up and saying, you know, how can we get six billion people around the world to practice gratitude? Well, now, of course, we know it's seven billion. So uh, even if we got all six billion, we'd still be a billion short, right, right now. And the spirit of Sir John was not just to encourage scientific research and publish in scientific journals, but rather to impact the world, essential as that is for progress, using the insights to improve one's life, to improve humanity was what he was all about, right, to encourage ideas that would heal lives, lead to the betterment of civilization. And that's what uh, Sir John promoted, and that's been a huge part of this initiative, not just science, but also practice. Uh, Thanks.org, this is very small, hard to read, but that's the global website, you know, how you affect six billion people. Well, you, got, you go global with these ideas, and we'll hear a little bit about that later on uh, today. I like this quote, once again, one more quote from one of Sir John's books regarding the practice, incorporating these ideas, taking the theoretical ideas, but really living them out in one's life. He said, the supreme moments in the life of each of us occur whenever we grasp a new inspiring truth and appropriate it so that it revitalizes our personality and becomes an inspiration for our life. Right? That's what gratitude can become. We can appropriate that figure out ways in which we can act upon it, develop it, amplify it, teach it to other people. See, because we're all on our gratitude journeys, right? And some are more advanced than others, but we all have a long way to go. Okay? Uh, same with me. You know, the, I talk about gratitude. I research gratitude. I study gratitude. I write about it because I need to hear this stuff as much as everyone, right? As much as anyone. It's like gratitude is good, it heals, it energizes, transforms, but sometimes I need to be reminded of that when I don't practice gratitude, when complaint seems so much easier than compliment, right? When disappointment, despair seems so much greater than, than delight. It's like I need to remember this, put into practice these ideas. Fortunately, my family is very good at reminding me. Uh, first my wife and now my younger uh, son, now he just turned 13, he says, come on, you know, when I'm uh, feeling a little bit negative, you know, come on, you know, gratitude guy, or, uh, you know, aren't you like Mr. Gratitude, Dr. Gratitude, right? So we can always improve, right? We can always get a little bit more on that road, up that mountain toward gratitude uh, on that journey. So it occurred to me recently that gratitude is something that has a foundation to it. For it to be, uh, I think, to stand the test of time, for it to have a solid structure, it will require three foundational stones. And Brother David and, and Jack Cornfield, they've written about 
joy, they've written about grace, and they've written about love, and I'll have a couple of quotes from them when I introduce them in just a bit. But I want to suggest to you today that gratitude involves these three principles, or three stones, three pillars, three foundational uh, rocks upon which we can build an edifice of gratitude. The first one I call looking for the good. When we find the good, we, gratitude requires eyes to see with. With our eyes wide open, we don't go through our days in a daze, as Brother David has said. We look for and notice and see the good, whether it's the good in the good or the good in the bad. Sometimes we can extract goodness out of bad things. We see the good. We experience joy. The simplest form of gratitude, one writer said, is joy. Gratitude rejoices in what has taken place or in what is. The joy of memory, the joy of what is or was. So joy is the first stone. Number two, we have to not just look for or see that good, but also receive it, right? Receive the good. Many people are very good at giving gifts, right? But not so good at receiving gifts. So you not only have to see the good, but actually uh, not only see it, but receive it, take it in. As Rick Hansen would say, friend of the Greater Good organization, take in the good, really absorb it and savor it, and that would be grace. That's what grace is. It's receiving gifts, right? It's receiving things that are, which are unearned or unmerited. We receive them. We acknowledge them. We experience them deeply this way. And then we just don't keep it inside. Gratitude requires a third stone, and that is giving back of the goodness, right? We want to return it in some measure to which we've received and are still receiving today. And that would be love, the third stone. So gratitude is complete. And when we look for, find the good, take in, really savor that goodness, and then give back the good through love. Three foundational stones of gratitude. Anyway, that's just a few ideas that I think will hope, you know, connect with some of the ideas we'll hear later on today. As we move through this uh, summit, learn really more about the essence of what gratitude is. It's really a day of, of inspiration plus information. You know, what a celebration should be. We learn more about gratitude. We come away inspired, you know, ready to go forth and practice gratitude, communicate gratitude, uh, live gratitude, right? The gratitude we encounter helps us believe in the goodness of the world and strengthens us thereby to do what is good also said Albert Schweitzer.